The approach for this video is that I'm going to talk a little bit about the strategy and approach behind getting minimalist, and then I'll be doing post-commentary over a recording of myself. The real challenge of minimalist is not, not how do you keep your deck small, but how do you keep the deck small and also win fights while doing that. Hey YouTube, Baylor here in the big cozy chair, and today I want to talk about the minimalist achievement in Slay the Spire. This is the achievement for beating the game with a five card deck or smaller, which is very, very, very small. Five cards is very difficult to get down to in a run, and so I'd say this is one of the hardest, if not the single hardest achievement to get in Slay the Spire. It's also an achievement that you're very unlikely to get in the course of normal gameplay, so I know there are a few of you out there who have hundreds or even thousand plus hours in the Slay the Spire, but do not have this minimalist achievement. If you're one of those players, then I challenge you to, after watching this video, get this achievement yourself and uh, finally unlock that. Like the speedrun video we did a couple weeks ago, the approach for this video is that I'm going to talk a little bit about the strategy and approach behind getting minimalist, and then I'll be doing post-commentary over a recording of myself achieving that achievement in a pretty quick time frame. I've got a, a fairly quick run with the defect I want to show off. For the minimalist achievement, you can use any of the four characters that you want, as long as it's not the silent. The Silent starts with two more starting cards in her deck. She's got a 12-card deck, five strikes, five defends, survivor, and neutralize, compared to the 10-card decks of the other characters. In a minimalist run, removals are a very, very valuable resource that you have to ration very carefully, and the two additional starting cards for Silent means that she's basically two removals behind the other characters. It's a, an order of magnitude of additional difficulty. It's not impossible to do with Silent, but it's much, much, much harder than with the other characters. So I, I highly do not recommend Silent for this challenge. I also strongly recommend playing on Zero Ascension. More Elites is more Relics, but Elites are pretty tough for Minimalist decks, as we'll see with the run coming up. And you definitely want to be below Ascension 10 when that Ascender's Bane Curse gets added to the deck, because that's another card that counts towards your total. And it's one that you can't remove, so it makes the challenge much, much, much more difficult as well. I'm going to be showing off this achievement with the Defect, my personal favorite character, and uh, showing off one of the strategies that it can use to win with a five or fewer card deck. If you find this video helpful, then be sure to let me know in the comments below um, what five cards you were able to get this achievement with. I'm, I'm really curious to see what kinds of different strategies people use to achieve this, because there's a whole bunch of different card combinations you can use to get a win, and I, I really want to see some of the creative approaches we use. Alright, with all that pre preface said, let's dive on in to the actual run here. So, starting out with the defect. I'm going to choose a card removal as my starting bonus from Niao here. When it comes to your starting bonuses, removals are definitely a huge priority for a minimalist run, as they get you, you know, those very valuable removals right away. You can also take money as a starting bonus, that's also a, a very good start, and transforms are quite good as well, since they allow you to allow you to replace your starter cards with more impactful stuff that you can potentially build around. I choose a path here in Act 1 that visits two stores. This is quite important. Stores are going to be a persistent and useful thing throughout the run, because every store offers you uh, a removal opportunity. I decided to pick up an Auto Shields here. It's a really efficient block card uh, that I think will help me through Act 1. I would find it quite useful immediately against the Jawworm. The first card or two that we pick up have to be pretty important. Um, you cannot really proceed forward without grabbing a, a card or two. The removals um, and uh, cards are, are really limited in this in this challenge, so you can only add maybe three or four cards, and I'm, I'm really serious about this, you can only add about three or four cards to your deck throughout the entirety of the run 
so those cards must be chosen really, really, really carefully. We pick up a Claw as the second card added, and Claw scales up uh, every time you play it. And I'm lucky enough to find a second Claw right away. So we've got two Claws and Auto Shields, and the goal from here is... Uh, by and large, just remove cards. This auto shields and two claws should be a strong enough foundation to kind of work with, especially with the upgrade, making it block 15. Got really lucky with the lightning strike on the, the back sentry there, and so we end up with a pretty clean elite fight. But this sentry's fight will give us a little preview of where the challenges of Minimalist can start to lie. Quite a few enemies in Slay the Spire add status cards to your deck, whether it be to your draw pile or to your discard pile. The sentries in Act 1 are one of the first that do so, but we'll find that they are a persistent problem for our minimalist attempt because the relatively small size of our deck means that these status cards are far more impactful. At the store, I choose to buy a removal and only removal. As a general rule, this is all we're allowed to do. The only thing that you should be spending money on in your stores is card removes. And save up as much as you can otherwise, because just getting one or two additional removals over the course of your run is going to have a huge impact. Another thing that can really help is finding relics that provide card removals, like the shovel, or this run is lucky enough to find the Smiling Mask, which causes removals to always be 50 gold at stores. Thanks to this relic, I'm going to be able to remove a card at every single store I visit, and that means that I'm going to want to visit as many stores as possible to maximize those card removals. You'll note that we're also skipping pretty much every card that we're offered at this point. We really don't have a lot of room to add more, unless we can find some more card removals. There are currently 10 cards in the deck, I need to get that down to 5 by the end of the run, so we need 5 more removals, plus 1 card remove for every additional card that I add to this deck. Easiest way to get there is to stop adding cards. So that's what I'm going to by and large do, and it's going to be a bit of a struggle to win fights with just these cards added. That's, I think, the real challenge of Minimalist is not not how do you keep your deck small, but how do you keep the deck small and also win fights while doing that. Relics and potions are a pretty big way to make this happen. We're gonna have to be very deliberate and careful with the potions that we have, and whatever relics we find, we're gonna hope that they are pretty useful to us. The ornamental fan here will be a little bit helpful if we can play three attacks in one turn. I'll get four block, and as we go into Slime Boss, I'm kind of hoping that we can use these claws to scale up quickly enough to destroy this fight. Not a very good split, unfortunately, but at least we're able to keep the, uh, the slimed out of the deck a little bit here. Kind of up to RNG from here, this was definitely a moment this run could have died. But thankfully the upgraded auto shields and the uh, and the claws make for a relatively clean uh, experience through. When it comes to boss relics, at least for this run, I'm not too interested in picking up a, a, a relic that gives me energy at the end of each turn. Our foundation here now is a couple of zero-cost attacks, these two claws, which we're looking to play as frequently as possible. So a boss relic that gives me energy isn't really going to make that happen any quicker or any better, and instead what we're looking for is something that provides either card removals, the Pandora's box, the empty cage, and the astrolabe are going to be the premium boss relics here. Um, or some other non-energy boss relic that like improves my card draw, such as uh, Runic Pyramid, something that gives me uh, a Sacred Bark for, for bonus potions would be pretty good too. Just anything except energy, really. We do make it through, I skip the rare card, because again, we don't have any room in the deck for additional cards. And there is the Astrolabe here, which I was talking about. But I end up deciding to go with the Frozen Core for a bit more block generation. Frozen Core is a, a, a fairly infrequently used uh, energy uh, defect relic for me. 
gives me a frost orb every turn, as long as there's an empty orb slot when I end my turn. And since this deck needs to shrink down even further, I, I do plan on removing the Zap card, which is currently generating lightning orbs for me. This is going to allow me to passively scale up my block a little bit slowly, but surely during combats, which we're going to find is pretty helpful as these two claws, which we're not drawing that frequently, right? We have with, with nine cards in the deck, we see the claws maybe like an average of once per turn. It's just not that quick when it comes to damage output, and that's going to cause some problems in these fights. Chosen another example of an enemy that adds status cards to the deck, and that becomes an increasing problem here. We really can't deal with these dazed that are being added and messing up our draws. Too bad, though. Plenty of good cards being offered here, but again, we really cannot afford to add any more cards. You, you do have to pick just three or four and try to win with it. You are going to feel extremely weak when you're playing Minimalist. It, it's just the nature of the challenge that you do not get to be very strong. Because this deck is so relatively slow at its damage output, something we want to do in both this act and in the next act is avoid elites where possible. The elite combats of Act, uh, especially 2 and 3, require that your damage output be both steady and significant. This deck has, unfortunately, neither of those things. But what we can do is speed this up by removing more cards. If we can slim it down a bit, get a couple of these defends out, we'll draw the claws more frequently and that'll lead to a lot more damage output. The good news is that the steady amount of block we're able to generate means that we're at least not losing health in these combats. If you're trying this challenge with uh, one of the other characters, you're going to find that you need, just like the, the claw in this run, you're going to need a way to cause your damage to go up over turn over turn. Whether this be with increased strength gain over time, something like a demon form can really enable Ironclad to do this challenge. Um, pressure points on Watcher can be a good way to get Minimalist, since that also scales damage in the same way as Claw. Uh, if you're trying it on Silent, again, I don't recommend that, but Poison would be a good way to go. A Bouncing Flask and a Catalyst can cause your damage to ramp up really quickly. We're offered another Claw, but again... We do not have the ability to, you know, we don't have the ability to afford adding more cards to this deck. So I skip that claw. We'll grab another removal at the shop. Finally getting rid of that zap because of the frozen core. Keeping those orb slots free means we can just generate consistent, uh, consistent frost. Starting to see part of the problem here, though, that opening draw of five block cards is really undesirable. It, it causes our damage output to be tragically slow. And that can really hurt you in, again, Act 2 Elites here. We, we said that this was the kind of fight you want to avoid, and I think we're about to see why that is. I can't adequately deal with these Gremlins, since I only have two claws for damage. And if Gremlin Leader keeps summoning them faster than I can deal with them, it's going to be a serious problem for me. Yeah, that looks like a that looks like a problem to me. <laughs> Fortunately, able to kill the wizard before it uses its ultimate blast on the third turn of it after its creation, but we do take a pretty nasty bop from the leader. The good news, however, is that because a minimalist deck has so few cards in it, it's really easy to get them all upgraded. We already have the important cards: the auto shields the dual cast, and both claws upgraded. And that means that we are free to rest at rest sites as much as we please. So even though I've lost, like, 
50 plus health to Grim Leader here. We're gonna be okay. A little bit of max health definitely helps. Again, another upgraded claw being offered. We could have had so many by now. Let's just sleep off these crippling body wounds. And head to the boss here. One more shop coming up, which means we'll go down to seven cards. That puts us in a position where we have two removals that we need in the next act. If we had no further cards. Hopefully this deck will be good enough to get through. We encounter the Red Mask Gang. I, I really have to fight these guys, even though we're not very good at this combat. Because the only other option is to give them all of your money, and that would prevent me from removing a card at the store. So even though I expect this fight to go fairly badly, you have to take it. Oof, one short on the uh, lethal on uh, Romeo here. Does not feel good. At least the red mask will help with the turn one of many of the fairly dangerous combats in Act 3, as well as making our boss a little bit less threatening. A bonus card removal from Cleric here is a great blessing. That's going to put us a little bit ahead of the removal game, down now to six cards, which means that we can maybe even afford to add one more card from here. Now that we've gotten a couple defends out of the deck, we can also see this ornamental fan starting to put in a little bit of work. That's why I decided to keep the strike, was so that we could do Claw Claw Strike as a single turn. Okay, we have a fully upgraded deck now, which means we can just sleep at every single fire. Champ is fortunately a fairly slowly paced boss. A uh, perfect matchup for these claws. I think we'd have much of a, a much harder time against the collector with this deck. Part of the success or failure of your minimalist run is is going to be how your deck matches up against your Act One, Two, and Three bosses. And so a little bit of luck in this. Uh, in this manner is it's definitely helpful. Don't be ashamed if it takes you multiple tries to get this achievement. Full disclosure, it actually took me three tries to record a successful attempt at this challenge. It's just not always the case that you're going to be offered cards that allow you to win, and not always going to be the case that the enemies that appear are going to let you pass. Definitely the case where being forced into an elite uh, on a minimalist attempt and having that elite be the wrong one can result in a run over with not much you can do about it. Alright, no problem for champ. Again, rare cards that I can't take. Feels so bad to skip all the rares. I decide to leap at the chance for an inserter here, giving me a really unusual combination of relics. The Frozen Core plus inserter means that my defect is going to automatically generate orb slots, and then those orb slots are going to automatically fill with frost orbs. So over time in combats, we're now going to create a huge array of frost orbs slowly over time, just kind of gradually scaling up the block even more. Didn't want to take the Culling Bell, since Culling Bell adds an unremovable curse, and we really can't afford that. Remember that the number that you're looking for in a Minimalist run is the number in the top right of the screen at 6 currently. That's the number that counts at the end of the run. 
You're allowed to generate cards in the middle of combat as much as you want. You can use attack potions, you can use Nilri's Codex, you can use Dead Branch. As long as the card isn't being permanently added to the deck, then it's legal to make as many of them as you want. Since this run has two shops that we're visiting in the act, we know we're guaranteed to get two removals. That means we're allowed to add one more card if we want to end with a total of five. And I decide to make that card Hologram. Hologram will let me get a claw out of the discard pile. And that'll speed us up quite significantly here. When it comes to your Act 3 pathing, the big thing to do is, just like Act 2, avoid elites where possible. You also want to be pretty mindful of events and combat. So it turns out Act 3 is just horrible for Minimalist. <laughs> One of the big things that makes the this act in particular really challenging is the Falling event, which is a fairly common event in this act that picks three cards at random from your deck and asks you to lose one of them. If your deck is only five cards, it may well be that you need both of the randomly chosen cards in order to win. Or all of the, the chosen cards. One power, one attack, and one skill. If you don't have any powers, then it'll only choose an attack and a skill. But if you need all two or all three of the cards that the event chooses, and you're forced to lose one, it can result in a really, really rough situation. And cause you to lose the run. You can mitigate this by avoiding question marks, or by having redundant cards in the deck as you're pathing through your Act 3 question marks, but at this point you should really only have seven or fewer cards. Being forced to lose one at random can be pretty bad. There's also quite a few enemies uh, in Act 3 that can really tax a minimalist deck. Lots of status cards that can be added from orb walkers or from nemesis. Giant head can really test your ability to scale up. Reptomancer can punish you for not having any AoE. It's a really tough place to be. So the quicker you can proceed through the act with less combat, the better. If you found an Omomori previously in your run, it really helps here. There's a lot of curses that can be dealt out in Act 3 as well. challenge does get a little bit, I guess, repetitive would be the word. Since your deck is so small, you start, to, as as you get down towards five cards, you're going to find that you draw the same five cards every turn, since that's all that's in the deck. And that can result in a deck that plays the same every single turn. It's not a bad thing, but definitely a little repetitive. The challenge becomes to find a set of cards that can tackle all the different challenges of the game while only having the same options available on each turn. One of the big reasons to build a large deck, you know, a 40 or 50 card deck in Slay the Spire is that you can have sort of a card for every situation. With Minimalist, the exact opposite is true. You need your one card to solve every situation, and there's only a few cards that can really do that well. We're unlucky enough here to run into Writhing Mass. This is one of the really challenging opponents in this act. Writhing Mass changes their attack intent randomly every time they're damaged. And, but far more importantly to us, they have one attack indicated by a purple swirly debuff icon that permanently adds a curse to your deck. That counts towards that five card limit for the minimalist achievement and we've already rationed out our removals such that we're going to hit exactly five cards by the end of the run with this one upcoming shove. And that means that if Writhing Mass adds a curse to my deck right now, I lose the run. 
will fail the achievement. So my approach to this fight is to attack Writhing Mass, but always leave one attack unplayed so that I can change their intent away from Curse if they give it to me. So I'll, I'll play Claws until I have one left, and if they're trying to curse me at that point, I'll play the final Claw. But if they're not trying to curse me, I don't play the final Claw. And that enables us to get through this combat safely without any curse. Nemesis here is another real big challenge for minimalist runs. Nemesis adds burns to your deck with some frequency, and Nemesis is also intangible every other turn. Nemesis is what I like to consider a consistency check. Nemesis asks you, can you draw your cards on the right turn, your damage cards on the turns that Nemesis is vulnerable, and can you draw your block cards on the turns that Nemesis is attacking you? As these burns start to pile up, that gets really, really challenging for our six-card deck. Really, really challenging. See that if we if we draw all the claws on the intangible turns and all the burns on the non-intangible turns, we have what's uh, affectionately known as a yikes moment. This is definitely yikes. This is precisely what we want to avoid. Elites this act. I thought when I was recording this that this was the end of my attempt. I, I was quite sure I was going to die. But not quite. He scraped through with only four hit points, a pretty crippling blow. But at least I can rest twice before the boss. And with one more shop, we can restock a little bit too. Remove our last defend, bringing us down to exactly the five cards we need. And I can now buy potions if I want to. I guess I decide on the cauldron here. Very in a bottle is uh, a nice insurance policy. It'll revive me if I die. And we have a strength potion and a distilled chaos as well. But now that we're down to exactly five cards, this is exactly our draw every turn. Claw, Claw, Hologram, Auto Shields, Dual Casts. So we can consistently block for a heck of a lot, and we can consistently play three Claws every single turn, which is pretty dang fast uh, damage output, as it turns out. I'd say we got pretty lucky to face Awakened One who does not, uh, does not increase their power over time, unless you play any powers, and this deck has no powers. But this should have been pretty successful against both the, the Shapes and the Time Eater as well. We're able to scale up the block and the damage quickly enough for Donu Decca. And we're not actually playing that many cards each turn, so Time Eater wouldn't be too bad either. Notably, we could play exactly six cards every turn if we wanted to. So we would never have to adjust our turn for time eater. Well, something to draw attention to here is the absolute night and day difference between this fight and the Nemesis fight. We cleanly get through Awaken 1, no damage taken compared to losing like 60 health to Nemesis. GG. There you go, that's the Middlemist achievement, winning with five or fewer cards in the deck. Not at all an easy one, but hopefully watching this helped you get some ideas for how you might achieve it yourself. Best of luck out there, Spire Slayers. Again, if you liked this video or you found it helpful, I encourage you to drop me a like and comment below, again, what five cards you were able to get this achievement with. GG, everybody. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all next time. <laughs>